So Father, we do thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you because you've brought this thing on the earth. We don't know why. But we do know that the church has returned to homes. And we do know, Lord, that people will be thinking now, having stepped back from the situation, that there's, um, there's something different, there's something about that, Lord. And we know that they'll probably miss corporate worship and the, the word from the, the pastor and things like that. But, Lord, I just pray that you'll renew minds and renew hearts, reset the body of Christ globally, and uh, make us into a lean, mean salvation machine. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> All right, so we're doing uh, the book of Acts, and as I've said for a while now, we're going to go through some narrative, historical narrative. So... um. What we've done, we've, we've gone all the way through uh, Pentecost, where the uh, disciples became apostles. They became sent, okay, sent ones. First of all, they were disciples of Jesus, and this, you never stop being a disciple of Jesus. And then you get to be um, somebody who Jesus sends, if you're an apostle. Okay, so um, that's what happened to them, and they were sent. Where were they sent? Can anyone remember what they, where they were sent at the end of the Gospels? Into all the nations. Into all the nations, yeah, and, and you know, from there it was like a, you know, an expanding um, ripple effect from where they were geographically, geographically, and um, that's eventually what happened. But first, we get detail about um, what um, what was happening at Ground Zero in Jerusalem. So there was great signs and wonders. There was great judgments taking place. That's very distracting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can't compete with dogs or children. Right? So it's just a fact you can't do it. Um, so it starts off in Jerusalem. We know that it was like a explosive um, salvations and healings and things like that. Uh, God worked through man. It was amazing. We saw healings of the the um, the, um, the guy at the beautiful gate, and that was almost like God's marketing plan to get the attention of the Jews and, and everybody who was there, the Gentiles. And uh, from there, we see outrageous grace and mercy kicking off in that place. And then um, we get an Ananias and Sapphira, the stoning of steam, there's death involved, there's martyrdom involved, there's all that kind of stuff. And then things start to go wrong and, and there's a persecution and the church scatters out of Jerusalem. And it scatters all over the place. Now here's a principle that I may, I can't remember that I mentioned this, but when we see the people of God scattered, scattered like that, we might think, oh, what went wrong? But in God's economy, it's what went right. Because when they scatter, they're taking the deposit of what they've had of Jesus far and wide. What we do is we get in our comfort zones. And if I saw people being healed around Perth, and people being um, saved, and people being miraculously this, that and the other, I ain't going nowhere. I'm sticking around that thing. You know what I mean? So it's contained in one place. But sometimes God goes boom and there's like a persecution to scatter. All these people have got a deposit of this miraculous saving grace of Jesus in their life so that they go far and wide and take it with them. So in a lot of ways in the New Testament, your mission is not geographical. You are the mission. You are the mission. Okay? We, obviously, God sends you to places. We we were like sent to Australia, and we, you know, we, we're doing this now. It's great. God sends you geographically, of course, but He can't. He, he doesn't send you unequipped, and He doesn't send you without the purposes, even in seed form, going off in your life. All right. So, and this is what happened to the apostles. They went off, and it's going to hone in on a couple of people, and really the apostle Paul and Peter and a couple of the travellers going on with Barnabas and everything. Don't last long with him. Um, and we find out that it, um, with Peter, remember the cloth with the different kind of animals on it? And God says, whatever I declare clean is clean. Whatever you think is unclean, get them thoughts out of your head, it's clean. Right? In other words, he's saying, you're, you look down on the Gentiles because they don't have this law, which is, you know, don't touch this, <coughs> put this down, pick that up. And that's what the prescription is. And if you're not doing that, you're like a dog. You know, you don't, you don't have a law. You know, you're unclean. Um... So, I don't want you to think like that anymore. The Gentiles are included in this gospel of grace. And now we're seeing this picking up with Paul and all that kind of thing. And we're going to pick it up on chapter 13, verse 13. And we're going to, we're going to see a, a bit of a story. I'm going to do a lot of reading, then I'm going to come back to some stuff um, so that we can get through this. And next I want to go to Hebrews, I think. Hebrews. Chapter 13, verse? Chapter 13, 13. <clears throat> 
I'm reading from the NIV. It's not my... I don't have to read from the NIV. I'm not stuck on it for any reason. I've got a King James Bible amplified. I've got loads of Bibles. But this is for, this is for historical narrative. 13. 13. 13. 13. Yeah. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Persia in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Persia, they went on to Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the synagogue rulers sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Men of Israel and you Gentiles who <coughs> worship God, listen to me. So just to draw your attention that that's in Acts 2.15, Acts 2.22 and Acts 7.2. Okay? And also here, um, listen to me. It's a thing that they seem to say, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. He endured their conduct for about 40 years in the desert. He overthrew seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, from the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled for 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him. And here's what he said. I have testified concerning him. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Now, if you want to just put a mark there, because we're going back to that. From this man's descendants, God brought to Israel the Saviour, Jesus, as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not that one. No, but he is coming after me, whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, children of Abraham, and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rules did not recognise Jesus, yet in condemning him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree, there it is, mention of the tree again, and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who had travelled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news, what God promised our forefathers, he, f he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it's written in the second psalm, you are, you are my son, today I have become your father. The fact that God raised him from the dead, never to decay, is stated in these words, I will give the holy and pure, sure blessings promised to David. And it's also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his fathers, and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus there is forgiveness of sins, as is, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through, through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything that could not be justified from the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. As Paul and Bar Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord commanded us. I made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honoured the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed let me read that last bit again and all who were appointed for eternal life believed i'll just go down to 14 mm -hmm. the word of the lord spread through the whole region but the jews incited the god-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city they stirred up persecution against paul and barnabas and expelled them from their region so they shook the dust from their feet in protest against them and went to iconium 
And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord, that's the Word of God, chapter 13. Just want to draw your attention to um, uh, verse 22. So he, Paul's telling the story after removing Saul. He made David their king. He testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. So there's a connection there. Okay. God knows when you're going to be uh, searching after his heart. All right. Um, I think you can't really become a Christian unless you are. Because you find out who God is and all that. But then we're easily diverted in that, that day and age. And in our day and age. And um, we can be searching after several different things. Which look like we're searching after God. And aren't really a bad thing in and of themselves. But if it's not in combination with searching after God's own heart. We can end up getting a little bit shipwrecked. And I'll just mention a few things. Even something like we're searching after God's healing. So this is a tricky one because God does heal today. And if you're sick, then I would press into God for healing, for sure. But only in combination with prizing his heart as the main thing that we're chasing after. Okay? So it's first his heart. It's, it's first with everything we're chasing after God's own heart. We could be chasing after God's promotion. God promotes. He did it with Joshua. I'm going to make you great in the eyes of the people. But that was God's will to do that. And Joshua was a man, of, you know, he was chasing after God's heart as well. It could be blessing. Nothing wrong with chasing God for blessing. He wants to bless you. All right? But if it's not in combination with chasing after God's own heart, right, we, we, we get into problems. It could be advancement. It could be choice of partner. It could be looking for the perfect life. If you're looking for the perfect life, you're in the wrong business. It doesn't work with Christianity. You're not going to get perfection, and you're certainly not going to be perfect till you're in glory. So if you're not healed, advanced, promoted, or blessed, it doesn't matter... You, you, you've got to be pursuing God's own heart. All right. So this is what I just wanted to do. Then this was a couple of weeks ago, or was it last week? No, it was a couple of weeks ago in the Sunday thing that we met together, and it was that Colossians. And the reason I'm coming back to that is because you were reading it in here to these two, and without knowing anything about it, I turned to it and thought, I'm going to read from Colossians chapter three, and it was like that kind of to me that was a tie up, and it's it's kept me in that space for for like two weeks now. Just thinking, you know what, God, you, you, I think you wanted to say something and all that. And um, so I wanted to go and, you know, look at what, what is it? Wouldn't it be great? And, and isn't it the ultimate pursuit that we stand here or sit here today and think, I want to do everything that God wants me to do? If I could just flick a switch and turn, like, Gary to zero and Jesus to, to 11. Amen. Right, I mean, and then I just want to live like that. But there's too much of Gary that gets turned up. I might be on a four one day. I might be on a seven one day. You know? And, and as, as, that, as my numbers go up, God's go down. Because I'm, I'm, I'm working from the flesh and I'm going after my own desires. And it might be healing, promotion, blessing, advancement, choice of partner, where I've got one. Um, um, per, the perfect life. I might be turning them, them values up to like nine or ten. And as I'm doing that, automatically, the chasing after God's own heart goes down. You know? So this is the thing. Just a few things. How can we, how can we be sure that we're chasing after God's own heart and consistently doing so? Well, one of the things that we can do is say, basically, healing, advancement, promotion and blessing are not essential to your life. Now, you might think, Gary, you don't live my life. I've got pain. I've got injury. I've got stuff going through my body. I'm actually in pain right now got a real bad thing going up my arm um, but you know you might say that you, you're on a position of strength Gary you, 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 you look partially functional but you know <laughs> and you, you know your ugliness might be something that's a rod for your own back but you know you know you've got it good how can you say don't chase healing you know it's the thing that would make my life whole I, it would in a sense but what would make your life whole now is that those values go down lower and lower and chasing after God himself goes higher and higher. And we, and we, and we, we tend to go, just a minute, because this, look at the combination. He is a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. There's the, there's the formula. How can I do everything you want me to do? How can I get to that reward? And God goes, you know, I'm not even going to, there's hardly any wood here and stubble in this. It's all silver, gold and precious stones. Look at this, I can't even lift it. God's like going, you know, get an angel to help me. I don't, he won't do that. But 
you get there into, into your award and there's hardly anything that you did in and of your own strength right how can we do that and there it is there's the answer a man after my own heart what we did we turned to one one oh, sorry colossians 3 verse 1 to 3 it, it, you know set your minds on things above set your heart on things above and we discussed it on sunday and we I'm, it's just been on my mind I've, I've shared it with some colleagues at work as well you know about the, the the regions where this goes into with the the difference between your heart and mind so if your heart's after god if you're setting your heart onto jesus and all that and that can be easily swayed we can be chasing after we can set our heart on healing we can set our hearts on blessing advancement you know getting all the the, the the formula of my life right if only blank was fixed by you God if only that was right if only these things came into line if only these ducks were all lined up in a row if only my visa was sorted if only my uni was sorted if only my healing was sorted if only I could just automatically pass my exams without going to school if only whatever you know all those things were sorted if only I was qualified and ready to go to earn all that money then everything would be fine well, in a way, in a logical way of thinking, in a worldly way of thinking, you can tick boxes like that. But unless you're really pursuing God's own heart, and that's really pursuing God himself, unreservedly, without any tagging on a lottery win sometime onto it. You know, I, I can't wait until I've got that, you know, Wrangler Jeep with all the mods. I can't, you know, and people chase after that stuff, you know. <laughs> but um, anyway, it probably went over your head. But um, I got it, yeah. did you? Okay. So, yeah. If, you, if, you, but if you're anchoring after that stuff, then it, you're gonna, you're gonna, you know, you might even get it. The worst thing I reckon you could get is the things that you're anchoring after over God, because if that happens, you'll go. Now I'm satisfied, and then you'll go into plateau mode, and you, you, you. But it's set your hearts, set it, fix it in. Somehow, do some engineering so you can go. I'm going to not move from here. And part of the thing is awareness of the fact that we can sway so much and we can be easily distracted. We've all got spiritual ADHD, right? We just have, right? And that's just a fact. Spiritual ADHD. And what we do is it's attention deficiency. I don't even know what the rest of it is. I should do. I'm supposed to know this, right? But I don't, right? Study right now. I don't know what that is. But we do. And we, and we go, you know, God... You might have watched something that blesses you on TV or you've a verse got to you or you listen to your favourite song and you somehow you had a moment with Jesus driving down to work or whatever. That could have happened and you're encouraged. Right? And you go, you know, that's it, I'm all in. So I'm setting my heart and mind on things above. I'm not going to diverge. Right? Next thing you know, so you get like a, you know, a Facebook advert for a nice car or a bit of jewellery or something that you've, you know, or even just, uh, even just um, an opportunity to to get something that you've really just thought mm, I wouldn't mind that adding to my life next thing you know you're scrolling down and you're looking at this thing and, and it's not like in that moment that you've taken your heart off Jesus it's just that the more things that pass us you remember there used to be this program on TV in Britain and it was the, the generation game who remembers the generation game? Yeah. Right, and what happened is at the end, it was it the generation game where they had all these things and they had to, Ooh. it went past on a conveyor belt and they had, they had, to, remember they had to remember all the things remember that were on it. Stuff. They never remembered it was like <laughs> my, <laughs> microwave oven. <laughs> but then the microwave ovens, the fact that it was like the size of this house, it was like a microwave oven. You had to like have a key for the door. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't that bad. But um, and they were like bicycles and you know, like all this stuff, and, and then it would all stop. And then the guy had to go, right, you've got 60 seconds to remember as many things that went past you. And everything that he remembered, he got. Right, But it's a bit like that in Christianity. As we live our life through the day, or even through the week, and if you're really strong, it might take you a month to get to this place. We get all these things that pass before. Ooh, look at that. Ooh, ooh, that's nice. Look at that. Ah, oh, I've always wanted one of them. Do you want one of these? Shall we get one of these? Shall we save up for a spa? Shall we put a spa in our back? Shall we luxuriate everything in our lives so we don't have to worry about everything? And you go, and it's like, after a while, you go, you go in. Where's my spa? Where's my four-wheel drive? Where's my Rolex Timex money? Um, where, where's my new blank? Where's, where's that thing? Where's that thing that I've desired? Now, it gets a bit complicated, this, because we have got needs. There is healing in this room that's needed. There is hearts that need to be healed. There is genuine um, 
things that we 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 we, we need. Mm. So we don't, no, it's not belittling them things or saying that's not part of the whole thing. <coughs> But the whole thing is, is that hankering after anything, even the things that you dearly need and the things that Jesus knows you need, taking your eyes off God for that thing is still taking your eyes off the heart of God. And, um, and then we, we find ourselves um, after, uh, Gary's a man after his own Jeep. You know, it's not like that, but, you know, Gary's a man after his own, don't roll your eyes, Jan. <laughs> Gary's a man after his own spa. Gary's a... A man after his own, I don't even know. Um, what am I after? I don't really know. Chardonnay, I don't know, somewhere else. <laughs> a, ma- a, ma- a man after his own whatever, okay? So that, that's the kind of thing what it is. And I haven't even got to these other notes, but our heart and our minds are two different things. Our heart can do that, but it's our mind that gets distracted. It's our mind who's trying to remember all the things that passed before us, like the generation game, and trying to you know, acquire those goods. So we've got a disconnect. It's really serious if your heart is permanently not seeking after God. Because you have to be careful as well, though, because the, 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 a lot of the Christian books out there preaching and teaching are getting your focus on, you know, like prayer, language for your healing. You should be doing more of this, and then you'll get healed, and you do more of that. And it does. It actually takes your mind away from being joyful, whatever the circumstances because you become obsessed with pursuing whatever it was, whatever it is, even if, even if it's in, you know, what you would think is God's will. That's what happened to me. I became so obsessed with being sick that I realised that my life wasn't about Jesus. It was about getting from Jesus. Getting from, yeah, it was about the healing and why am I sick and why am I not healed and, you know. That's it. That was because of all the false teaching around it. Absolutely. There there is some, there is some wisdom within the parentheses of being one after God's own heart. There is like a, uh, some teachings in that, how you can keep yourself focused, how you can keep yourself, you know, and, and, and that part of it is recognition, acknowledging, confronting the fact that we um, are prone to going to certain things, you know, and we know what our go-tos are, we know what our black museum is, what are um, things that we're sometimes secretly hankering after. Mm-hmm. Not so secret sometimes. Um, but if you're if you're not healed, advanced, promoted, or blessed, it doesn't matter. You're pursuing God's heart, yeah. and that's it. That's the aim of our life to pursue God's heart. Because then there's a guarantee. I reckon it's a guarantee. You will do what God wants you to do. Mm. You know. Mm. And then then and and like I've said before, and I think it's a principle that's lost a lot a lot of the ways. Um, if you if if God wants you to be the best wife ever, that's your calling. If God wants you to be the best husband and couple ever, that's your calling. The best, um, you know, child who obeys the parents. That's a command, by the way. Um, that's your calling. And uh, <laughs> and um, all these grandiose things that we've seen that have come up through the historical church system that places, you know, value systems on spirituality creates um, a hankering after being there as well. So all this promotion and advancement and... Um, it's, it's something which is, is nothing to the Lord. If you are the best um, husband that, you know, and, you, you, and father or whatever, that might be your calling, and then you'll get a full reward from Jesus. But if you're like Ravi Zacharias, pray for him, by the way. He's not going to survive this, I don't think, unless God heals him. Um, you know, he spoke on to more people probably than Billy Graham or something. He probably has, you know, over the, what is it, 40 to 50 years of his ministry. And, um, you know, he'll get a fair reward as the, as the uh, guy who just... I think the challenge, challenge of this age is to hold back from stepping in and leaning into something. It's how much you're not going to, you know, put yourself into the position what looks like it's advancement and promotion in God, you know? Um, I mean, what, you wouldn't miss it if, if God was doing something with your life because God's irresistible. You can't stop him, you know? Mm. But... Um, so there's like, I like that thing, he hems me in behind and before, and I've said this before, because you're not going to lag behind if you're hemmed in so much that you're missing it. And you're not going to advance yourself so much that you get ahead of God. Yeah. You know, and that's easy to do, especially when you're young, right? Uh, you, you get ahead of God, and then God's not doing what you think he's doing. Mm-hmm. And then you're doing a fruitless work, and you get really discouraged, because you think, well, I thought God was in this. But he hems, David said, he hems me in behind and before, 
so you're kind of stitched into this place and that can be uncomfortable because you can get frustrated because God have you ever noticed doesn't really speed things up <laughs> takes his time a little bit with stuff yeah. and half of the time he's doing it just to watch you to go what are you going to do next because you've got to realise that I'm in control not you mm. and the reason why you're frustrated is that your control is trying to get out of this stitched in place I'm going to meet that need you know and God's got a group over there who's going to meet that need better than you ever would yeah. you've seen the need doesn't mean you have to go and meet it because it's a need you know but if the Holy Spirit does something in you and gives you a Holy Spirit burden for that need it may be it financial be it do you know give a bit of your time um, a bit of your energy a bit of your wisdom a bit of your I don't know grunt might be who knows what it, what it is but then respond to it if it's God but needs in, in and of themselves are not like respond worthy just because the needs <coughs> you know what I mean? so that's why we need to be having our hearts after God's own heart then we will fulfil all he wants us to do there's a big difference so Colossians 3 1 to 3 heart and mind set your hearts and mind on things above that's not helpful the dog's waving at us through Skype it's like gosh <laughs> so to, we, you know I've got a lot I've got through a lot of this it's a pursuit beyond self okay we've got to get used to pursuing beyond self because usually our pursuits can be really about us and there's nothing wrong with it being about us because we're usually in families and we need to provide for families and we need to make sure that with our loved ones and those in our family and sometimes our extended family are looked after that's just a fact but this pursuit beyond self is a, is a promise and a, and, a, and a way of saying to God and some of you might want to say it to God tonight afresh or you just this is just confirming where you are already or it's just a big revelation for you to say I need to book my ideas up and I hope it is um, we can recommit our hearts to being set on Jesus and that's that, that's a recommitment of our devotional love towards him you know anyone can listen to a few songs and on the way to work but your devotional life is important because that's where you connect with Jesus and you say I don't just worship you even though ju just worship isn't the right way of putting it I actually love and adore you Jesus I just do and in the core of your being there's some things what I've been seeing on TV recently which have taken me straight to the core of when I got saved and what I felt like when I got saved and it's been just beautiful to revisit that thing and to go you know um, this has reminded me of the wonderful thing that God's done in my life yeah. and sometimes through life and through the difficulties and the, the real needs that we have we, um, we can be distracted even on that point do I love Jesus still? do I? Because I've not really cried a lot recently in, in his presence. I've not really expressed that to him. Where, where's that expression gone? And now I'm concerned. Now I'm, no, don't be concerned. It's in there, but it's just a case of refocusing and resetting and, um, and putting, um, blessing, uh, you know, getting your heart um, on things above. Your mind's a different thing. That's, that's discipline. That's why we fast. That's why we, um, we're going to talk about fasting when we get into the book of Hebrews. But um, we train our fasting is training our bodies to not be so distracted. You know, so what's the what's one of the biggest distractions for everybody on earth, apart from the obvious one, food, right? The, um, <laughs> that's um, a big distraction. So when you mm -hmm. starve yourself of that, what then your body's going, well, what are you doing? And you, you go in, and then your will goes, not eating. Some people in this room may need to take advice, probably me as well, before you fast for a long time. Okay, but um, but fasting's a, a thing that. We're going to be exploring a little bit, uh, even before the axe is finished, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, just to see if it's got a place in today's world. The short answer is yes, but it's a case of we are Westerners and we don't like it. You can fast most things. Anything that you've got in, habitually involved in, you can fast it and, it, and it's starting to tell your body that you're in control. You know, your cravings, I'm in control. Your um, habits, wants, passions, I'm in control of them. They're going to be brought in, reeled in, you know. And fasting is one way of doing that. Fasting and prayer in combination, actually. So that's that's one thing that fasting does. So a pursuit beyond self, um, and and all of this sits in the context of a recognition. And I'm going to finish with this one of identity, a recognition of your own identity in Christ. You've been adopted, blessed, and um, 
put on the rock of salvation and all that's the devil's in complete hysteria to get you to forget all this and to get to you to forget who you are right you are a child of god legally it's a legal binding contract you can't get out of it you've been sealed by the holy spirit remember all this from ephesians you've been sealed and once we can get our identity sorted out we go what should i be pursuing what's what's my right pursuits as, as this person if you if you identify as an athlete what are you going to be pursuing being the fastest runner or the fastest whatever athletes do other than running if you're a boxer what are you going to be pursuing yeah, to knock the man out in front of you um, if you are a racing driver what are you pursuing to be the fastest get over the finish line safely right? and be first at it if you're a Christian if you're a Christian what's your pursuit Jesus. the heart of God pursuing the heart of God so I want to I just my I just always wanted to do everything you know right for God everything that he wants me to do and it's a, it's a noble pursuit and I think it starts with all these things that we talked about tonight recognizing what we like what our distractions are, spiritual ADHD, and fixing our heart on God, a pursuit beyond self, a recognition of your own identity in Christ, and then acting upon that daily with a devotional love, time of love um, and, and worship and prayer, you one-on-one -on -one between you and God. It can be five minutes of quality. Some of these Psalms take 30 seconds to read, but when, when they're read from a heart that's pursuing his, God's blessed by it and you're blessed by it you can read Psalm 119 it probably takes you about 5 to 7 minutes alright but if that's what you want to do that's cool lots of words but God just wants a heart that goes I love you let's pray Father we thank you for um, the thing that you've done in all our lives Lord God you've spoken life over us Lord you've given us light into our darkness you've separated light from darkness we know right from wrong and but lord it gets so confused there's so many grow gray, gray, gray areas so many areas which are on red alert sometimes for healing and pain and tragedy and suffering so lord we give all this to you tonight lord and we commit ourselves to be people who are um, pursuing your heart lord god we want to fulfill the purposes in this generation that you've got us to do as individuals and families and a church and uh, even the wider connotations of all that so as we just lift all this to you lord and commit ourselves afresh to a, a walking well with eyes fixed on you and hearts set on you and minds fixated on you help us to just fulfill all that we, we need to do to make us um into people who um, walk well in jesus name amen. amen any questions before we turn it off Any questions from the internet internet superhighway? Has the dog got any questions? He looks as if he's got something to say. He does. He, he's a bit confused by that. He's probably watching all the faces. He probably hear you. Hello. Dashi. Say, um. What? Hi, Dash. <laughs> he's freaked out. For people, for people listening, we've got a dog over Skype. It might sound a bit weird, this, if you don't know the context. <laughs> These are the days of COVID-19. We're all trying to get together as a group, but still some of us can't be in the room. So. <laughs> Rachel, did you have a question? Uh, no, not really. Just... Um, it's, it's, it's a daily challenge, you know, to be to put aside all the things that distract you from being like I like, like was um, a man after God's heart. Um, so I just wondered if we've got any like I don't know, hints or tips on how we can in our ordinary everyday lives making sure that we do that. Yeah, um, it's the same. It's the formula doesn't really change in a sense. It's um, the main thing is that genuine, you know, getting back to that genuine love for God, um, and love for Jesus really, and um, 
and and even things like having a morning prayer time that's at a certain time and it goes for a certain time and then you're trying to read as much scripture and then by doing them things you think that them them things in and of themselves are doing some kind of you know like magical work to bringing you closer to God when actually it can become religion that you're doing it by rote okay but but beyond all that in the rubble of all the religion if you pull it all apart there's a genuine person who's got saved and has got the Holy Spirit living in your life and uh, you love him because he loved you first Mm -hmm. so therefore we can go I'm getting back I'm getting back to the heart of worship you know and it's all about who you it's all about you Jesus good song that and um and then it's, it's, it's trying to clear the rubble out and find out what we've been told is a Christian practice. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with praying. There's nothing wrong with reading scripture at all. But if it's not set in the, the, the kind of, um, what's that thing called where a jewel's set in a ring? The pedestal. Calls. The claw. Yeah, if, if it's not set in the basis of a love for Jesus, then it's going to be, I've read the Psalms because um, my life's been dry and I've just read words and I've understood exactly what they mean who said it, what the context is the theology behind it right? but I didn't connect with Jesus mm. and I didn't really, and don't, you won't do it every day but you know, you can get to a point where you just go you know, even, even Lord I haven't got much time, I'm late for work I've got to be there, in, in like, you know, I've got to get in the car and if you just turn the music off in the car and even though the music might be a blessing in and of itself it's not that what you're pursuing that's just the theatre mm of the love for Jesus that you've got so first of all it's that it's, it's looking at what we've what we've covered that love with mm. uh, religious practices things that we genuinely think are right to do you know it's, it's complex but then there's nothing wrong with just saying and I'd say to everybody stop for three weeks doing everything that you do and every single day just get 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 before the Lord, on your way to work or whatever, put time aside and just say, Lord, I want to get back to that love that I've got for you. I want to be, I want to be all like that fountain that overflows, mm-hmm. you know. And um, and then when you read Scripture and you approach Scripture, you, you come there, you, you go with a, it's like a, a bubbling over of gratitude and thankfulness towards the Lord, which makes reading of Scripture. You don't really have to read a thousand verses or even twenty, right? You might read mm-hmm. just set your heart and mind on things above you know which it says in augmentation of Colossians uh, 3 chapter uh, verse 1 and 2 you know you might read that but that takes a whole new thing when you know that that's his desire and you read it here where it says uh, David was a man after my own heart he will do everything I want him to do and there's Paul telling you years later that that's what we have to do today there's nothing changed Mm. but we've got more rubble and um, stuff that can fall in on that, on top of that, and make it look like we're doing something, you know, to help. And then, once you've got that that focus, um, read the scriptures every day. Just read the scriptures. Just try and get some scripture going. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not sure about read the Bible in, in a year. I don't. I'm not sure about them things. I, I don't. I've never liked them. Um, it always gets on uh, two chronicles, and it's just names for like three weeks, oh. and you're like, gosh. You know, so um, so it loses. It just puts a spear in spontaneity. But then spiritual bingo is wrong as well. Getting your Bible and going, what are you saying to me today? Two and three, twenty-three. You know, <laughs> Gary, you're a loser. Oh no, just sorry. <laughs> so, 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 th- so we've got to strike a balance. And I think th- the way that balance comes is by th- the first thing is to just you know, you know rediscover that love for God, love for Jesus and um, and then you know, direct it to the Father because the point of Jesus is to re- reunite you with the Father mm. who's adopted you resurrected your spirit give you you know, a program to make your heart uh, and your mind be, be clen- cleansed over time and renewed and um, there we go that's the thing mm-hmm. and then, then you've got your when your gratefulness and thankfulness is in place and you're just really loving Jesus you can put your songs on and then your song becomes worship but if you turn the song on to try and usher up that love for Jesus then you've, you, you've gone to the wrong thing first you know yeah. it's kind of so even when you get up and you, you can you get your first cup of coffee just just install thankfulness and gratefulness into that and look at the toaster and say you're 
making great toast this morning. Thank you for the toast, Jesus. You know, yeah. and it, fake it till you make it because you know, um, even if you get up and you feel lousy and you're walking through the front room going, I feel lousy. Kick the cat. You know, not on purpose. It just trips you up. Um, you know, the, the coffee machine doesn't work. And Gary's snoring. I'm talking about Ellen now. Gary's snoring in bed and he's not. He's got another two hours to go to sleep and I'm up at five. You know what I mean? Be thankful that we've got jobs. I'm extra thankful that I can sleep till seven. But anyway, let's not go there. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it's yes, yeah, in and in, in getting that lifestyle. That when the sun comes up in the morning, if you see the sun coming up and you're not at work too early, then you know thank God for that. Anyone else got any suggestions of what you do to to yeah. make this all work? I think the talking to God more often with less words that actually count. Yeah, yeah. You're always taught to start your day with the Lord, which is true. I mean, I get out of bed in the morning, Jesus, you know, I mean, that's obvious, but, you know, that whole do it for an hour, do it for 30 minutes and pray, and it becomes very religious, and I don't think it really does anything. I think having, memor- memorizing, you know, a few powerful scriptures and being grateful and thankful all day and every day mm-hmm. really worked for me. Less is more, yeah. definitely. You know, like that going into your, they'll be like the Pharisees and, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. all that, you know, I go to church and I'm intimidated because they know how to pray. It's, <coughs> it's hilarious because I probably could talk before I could walk. It's not a secret, we know, I talk a lot. But I can't pray a lot. And I think God does it on purpose because they're just waffling on and on and on. And I've sat with women who can pray for 30 minutes straight about, I don't know what, nothing really. Got to walk out. You know, I forgot what we're doing like that. I just think that, it's you know, it's I don't thing. get up and talk for an hour in the morning. I just talk to Jesus all day, like quality, quantity. Of quantity. Yeah, the quality of you know, it's always yeah. In the giving thanks, being grateful, remembering who He is. In the Bible college I used to go to, yeah. they um they had this principle right, and this guy they used to ask students to get up and pray, and some of them just liked to hear the sound of their own voice, mm-hmm. and you all had to stand up and pray like that when you had a meal together. And um, they asked the student to get up and he prayed and he's like, Lord God of the heavens and the earth, the one who makes the rings of Saturn and the, the clouds of Jupiter. Pr- principal, after about a minute and a half, he sat down and started eating his dinner. <laughs> Everyone's looking, what are you doing? He's like, I'm not listening to that crap. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's along the lines of, you know, yeah. you can be all kind of like. But when you're a new, when you're a baby you're like Christian, you've just walked into church, you've never been to any of these kind of churches ever in your life. That is the standard. That is the norm. That's what you're working towards. You are trying to become like that more, pursuing their likeness of Christ, being a Christian, than you are actually pursuing what Jesus or God, you know, what God wants for you specifically. You know, yep. I need to pray like that. I need to get up. I need to go to their worship meetings. I need to do all of this in order to maintain being a Christian or being good enough before God or whatever, I don't even know what I was doing it for, that was normal and then it was so exhausting I just kicked it in the butt and started again and now my life is much better, my faith is better my relationship with Jesus is better and it's way less complicated with less formulas and but Jesus said it, didn't he? They, they like to stand on the street corners and be seen to, and that's what it is. It's like, you know, look, we we are now marketing this way of being spiritual, and um, it's not like that at all. Anyway, I'm gonna, time's ticking away. I'm turning it off. Amen.